Marshall and Sagar here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Everyone, welcome back to our bi-weekly-ish discussion episodes where we talk about the news, broader context behind our shows, all those things. Quick note before we get into it, this is brought to you by your Supercast subscribers. You could go to realignment.supercast.com or you can go to the link at the top of the show notes. We're doing this completely unpaywalled. We're getting the support we get to increase the production from three to four episodes a week because supporters like this show. They like what we're doing. Sagar, quick shout out to what we're doing, why it's an important bit, and then we'll get into the actual discussion. Yeah, I mean, this is a very unique format because this is all free. Um, and we're just asking that you guys support us so that we can pay the absolute bills. As promised, like we have not made $1 um, from any salary or anything off of this. We're purely just asking for your support in order to make sure that we can cover uh, all of the expenses, the mics and the cameras and all of the added production, as well as increasing the YouTube. Uh, there's going to be some fun stuff. That's coming down the pipeline for everybody. But uh, as I learned over breaking points, uh, video production and all of this is inordinately expensive. So if you guys can help us out here, uh, it really, really helps a lot. We're not a sub stack. It's not a newsletter. It's a full fledged uh, production. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's why if you ever watch it, other people, they're always asking for some level of support because I truly understand like what the margins actually look like in this business. Okay, uh, Marshall, what do you want to actually start with? Yeah, so let's start with the the obvious topic, the Uvalde shooting, and how you actually have been reporting again. But I'd love for you to go into your actual background of why I think you better provide such really valuable coverage of this issue. It speaks to even your pre White House correspondent days. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. People are like, "Where did you, this come from?" I'm like, "Yeah, actually, you don't know. Most people don't know." But my original coverage, I spent years doing this, was terrorism. So. I covered the Syrian civil war. I covered a lot of ISIS attacks. I have written extensively about mass casualty events. So I'm actually pretty familiar, both at a tactical and a strategic level, about how these things are supposed to go. Uh, covered Parkland extensively at the time uh, when I was a White House correspondent. I remember being there, you know, during all the gun discussion and all of that. So all of this is more to say, like, I was there. I'm generally familiar. And immediately... Uh, when I started hearing the Texas Department of Safety timeline, I just thought this is bullshit because the original Steve McCraw, he's the director of TX, Texas Public Safety, came out and said, we engaged the shooter, a skilled resource officer engaged, shoot it, like shot at him. And yet, even though he was not wearing body armor, he was wearing a plate carrier, but no body armor was actually inside of it. He was able with a single AR-15 rifle in order to overwhelm these three police officers, lock himself in a room, and then it takes over an hour for Border Patrol agents to show up and get him. And I started listening to all this language. And once again, like I'm familiar enough to be like, oh, this is complete. This is a crock of shit. Because what I realized is that they, at first, they said a school resource officer engaged uh, Salvador Ramos. Not true. Now they say that's literally just not true. Then they're saying he was shooting around for like 12 minutes before he was even engaged by two police officers. So now it's two officers, not three. Then they said he locked himself, barricaded himself in the classroom. And here's, here's how they were spinning it. They were saying, we contained him in the classroom while we awaited for a tactical team to so, Hold on a second. The this I like I said, I have spoken to so many first responders like I know exactly what the drills are in these types of situations there. There's a saying that the killing stops when the shooting stops, as in you have to take down the target. Like if there is a target who is actively shooting and killing people, which there was, we know they're confirmed throughout the entire period. Yes, he killed the majority of the kids in the first couple of minutes, but there were at least some kids that were killed afterwards. And critically, response time matters because we know that at least one or two of these kids bled out on the way to the hospital. So if you save them 30 minutes earlier, who knows? Maybe they would have lived. So, And a quick this, thing to, to yeah. talk about the language here. The word contained suggests, okay, yeah. he's alive still. He's got his gun, but it's fine. Nothing no, will escalate not. from here. What we'll saying, well, that's right. what the words, that, right. that, that, that's what's slippery about the language yeah. here. They're all trying to spin it this way. And so I'm reading this and it doesn't make any sense. And that is really when the floodgates just start to open because the parents start speaking out and the parents come out and they're like, oh, well, actually, we were on the sidelines begging them to go inside and they weren't doing it. And then not only that, you have a mother, Yuvaldi mother, who hears about the shooting, drives 
50 miles, by the way, 50 miles, even at 75, 80 miles per hour, what is that? Like at least 25, 30 minute drive in, uh, in Uvalde, let's say. Uh, so she has enough time to get there, beg the cops to go in. They federal marshals put her in handcuffs. Then they put her out of handcuffs and she has time to go into the school and get her kids all before the shooter is dead. So once again, none of this makes any sense. And, all of the people who have come out of this, it just looks like a scandal of colossal proportions. Like we are looking at one of the worst and most bungled police responses in a mass casualty event since probably Parkland. Honestly, that was another thing. I covered Parkland extensively and the media wanted to focus on March for Our Lives and David Hogg and all this stuff. And the, the story always to me was, wow, this Broward County Sheriff deputy was securing the outside perimeter, a.k.a. he's a fucking coward, and was outside while Nicholas Cruz was inside slaughtering children. And actually, there are verified uh, reports there out of Parkland that, you know, Nicholas Cruz kind of took his time and was like going through the hallways. And there were at least a couple of kids killed once again uh, because they weren't engaged. Now, I've heard from some of the Blue Lives Matter crowd and all. They're like, well, you need to wait for information. Like, you don't know. You weren't there. Listen, if they had been honest with us up front, I don't think I would have been as hard. But it was very clear to me from day one. I was like, there has been a cover up here. Because here's the other thing on the whole body armor thing. I mean, look, you're just wearing a plate. And I was like, and I was like, so how did three cops not take this guy down? And then Again, I keep reading all these things like Border Patrol tactical. First of all, Border Patrol tactical. Why are they the ones who have to do it? They just happenstance happen to be in the area. Then I read uh, Border Patrol tactical had to ask for the key in order to breach the door. So I'm like, wait, so the cops never asked for a key before that one hour period before Salvador Ramos is taken down? Quick thing yeah, go ahead. to speak to yeah. barricaded, barricaded. That language suggests That's, that he's got exactly. a fridge That's or a door. Wall. Yeah, versus the door, also, was, Marshall, the door was locked. There was multiple windows in this classroom. He's actually been engaged through the windows. So we know that there was a breach opportunity, at least through the windows. And, you know, look, I think this is all crystallized with, uh, there was a Texas department. Uh, and let me pull this up because I want to get his language very specific. Yesterday, he was on CNN and he gave an interview and he was pressed on this by Wolf Blitzer. And he said, look, uh, these uh, cops were reluctant to engage the gunman, quote, because they could have been shot. And I'm sympathetic. Honestly, you know, look, I'm sitting here in my house. I don't know what I would do. But I'm you're not also, a cop. You're, yeah, you're not yeah, a cop. Like, and that's the, yeah, and, and, and that's the, the thing. The, you need to make that decision before you become a... And here's, you know, the, and I hate to sound like this, but what do we give you all this G.I. Joe equipment for and all these automatic weapons and helmets and, you know, an immense amount of qualified immunity. Like, we we treat them like kings, okay? And, I, you know, look, I think we should respect the people who keep us safe if they are keeping us safe. And there's clearly been a major violation of the social contract here. Uh, look, I'm willing to hear it out. The, the pushback I'm hearing today is, oh, well, they didn't have a ballistic shield and they needed that in order to breach the door. Again, like I'm sympathetic, but you know, the people I, I have spoken now to multiple people in law enforcement who tell me you go through the door, you go through the window. There's no, like there's little kids getting slaughtered in there. No, if you could save one, you go in and look, I hoped, I hope I would do the same thing if I was in that position. Look, I uh, I want to go back to something you said there because I actually disagree a bit on it, which is you said yeah. the media wanted to focus on the the Parkland like March for Our Lives thing, mm. and, and I and I think I actually think that the focus on that group was actually incredibly important, and it should actually it should shape how we think about what happens moving forward because I think oh. that was an important test of the American political system. Oh, interesting. In the I sense that the reason why Parkland mattered. David Hogg, Emma Gonzalez, like all these kids, like Kyle Kashuv going to going to the White House, like these actually were. You could critique the way David Hogg has performed since he got into Harvard, and I think that he has pretty much delegitimized himself as a as a person. Yeah, what happened to that these, pillow company? 
Yeah, I want to know what happened to the pillow a, company. Basically, for for folks, we're not going to get too into it, but search David Hogg, my pillow competitor, and you see the <laughs> depressing reality of what happens when you become overly online and you get too many Twitter followers when you're 18. But basically, this was this was this was a thing. Like th- these these were kids who are responding to a situation where it's like you and I can't really. It's hard to identify with what's going on here because um, I did a recording with Aaron and Armon, our production staff, that we're going to send to the subscribers that went out yesterday. And they were just talking about being a Gen Z kid and growing up with just school shootings, um, just like re- increased school shootings and school shooting drills. And like you and I did not go through that. I went through um, there some were, of it actually. Uh, but, really? Yeah, I don't is know if you te- did. Yeah, I actually went through some of well, it. Well, so so fair. I think Texas is yeah. at a coming. I'm moving to Texas, so like I could just be frank about this. Texas is a unique place. The rest of the country, mm. our months of California, our, Aaron's from New York, you were not doing active sco- shooter drills in the 1990s and 20, in the 2000s. Um, so if you are a Gen Z kid like the Parkland kids, you, this has been an ever present reality here. So I, I, I think that, I think that because the, the Parkland kids became overly partisan at a time when becoming partisan basically nukes your ability to be effective. It's easy for people on the right to dunk on them, but I really want to just focus on them. Let's say in 2017, you're you're a kid. This has happened. It's crazy. Your friends are dead. You want to respond. You think that activism is the model here. It didn't work. Um, it didn't work for a couple of reasons. And I I'd actually love to made hear you. things worse, to be honest. So, 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 so this is yeah. interesting. So Sagar, give me, so let's, let's take a step back from day one of, of when it happens. Like, why do you think, what did they do? And why do you think it did not work and actually made things worse? Well, that th- this is why, because one of the obvious takeaways from Parkland was, oh, um, we shouldn't have coward sheriffs, you know, <laughs> as people who were protecting the school. I'm not saying that isn't the only option, but it was basically excluded from the entire conversation to the detriment, I think. Let's say you are a gun control, seize your guns type activist. I think in a hyper-politicized environment, being not good faith in the honest accounting of what happened in this type of situation and effectively making the cat out of the bag in terms of gun confiscation, the mainstream elite liberal position. And I think we should be very clear about that, which is wait, that- Wait, 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 Parkland, wait, I want to push you on this. Yeah. Was, was, was okay, the Parkland position gun confiscation? Okay, so in spirit, yes. Uh, effectively, no. So look, effectively what happened was obviously we got all of the calls for universal background checks, et cetera, but let's be honest here, right? Which is that mansion to me type legislation has been on the floor since like Sandy Hook in terms of universal background checks. Also, universal background checks would not have stopped Nicholas Cruz and it would not have stopped uh, Salvador Ramos. There's only one policy that would have, well, okay, Nicholas Cruz, is. this is another uh, testy one, which is Nicholas Cruz was known to the FBI. He had been investigated previously. There were all kinds of crazy red flag. And I will also say, if you look on the Florida level, Florida did pass red flag legislation as a result what of is what's red, happened here. What, what, is red, what, is, what is red flag legislation? Red flag is effectively, red flag laws are effectively an administrative court's ability in order to adjudicate that you have mental health red flags and thus a judge can decide through like a quasi judicial proceeding that they could take away your ability to buy a gun. It gets very tricky because obviously you have a constitutional right um, to buy a gun. I'll channel Crystal and say under the current Supreme Court, you have a constitutional right to have a gun. I think you have a constitutional right to have a gun, whatever. Uh, the point is, is that it gets hard in order to do, but Florida, Connecticut, and various other states have actually already passed a lot of these laws. New York um, also, by the way, which is also a good precursor to, okay, well, we just had a mass shooting in Buffalo now, um, and uh, Mr. whatever his name is, was known and flagged to the mental health authorities by New York State. What happened? You know, didn't get red flagged. So the point that I'm making is there's major loopholes, not even loopholes, but just glaring errors in enforcing the current laws that we already have. And I think that Parkland and March for Our Lives was really instrumental in making it like the mainstream kind of activist position that AR-15 bans and gun confiscation, really, I think that's what led, Marshall, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, to what I think actually was a seminal moment was Beto during the Democratic debate, I think it was 2019, saying, damn right, we're coming for your AR-15. I, I, I genuinely think that that was 
really like across the Rubicon kind of cultural moment because he was deeply celebrated for it in the press. And I just remember thinking, I'm like, this is a disaster because this is another thing where, you know, one of the things that drives me most crazy about uh, elite liberal language is just like how coded it all is. So for example, when they say things like, this isn't political, it's like, no, 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 it's political. Or whenever they say things like common sense gun legislation, look, common sense gun legislation is universal background check. And uh, look, even then, I, I hear the caveats from the gun owner community and all exactly why they're against those types of things. But I would say like the vast majority of people are mostly fine with universal background check. Red flag law gets a little bit tricky just because of the administrative state and all of that stuff. But everyone can agree, take the current laws on the books and enforce them. That was the, another problem with the evangelical church shooting. I covered that pretty extensively back in 2000 and I think it was 2018. Basically, this uh, guy was convicted in the Air Force of domestic abuse, and the Air Force and the U.S. military was supposed to be reporting all these crimes to the FBI background check system, and they had turned out that they just had never done it. And they had reported like tens of thousands of crimes to the FBI background check. And the, who is against that? You know, like being like, okay, you know, the current domestic violence convicted people should not be able to buy guns. That's already the law in like, I think, all 50 states. So there you go. My point being that that's what common sense gun solution looks like. But whenever it gets coded by the media and whenever they say like, we need to do something about this, I mean, the general, I mean, look at the president. The president in his initial reaction to Uvalde is, you know, basically what's also weird to me is like how little the talking points have evolved over the last 20 years. Like it feels like this debate is literally stuck in time. Um, he was like, De you know, deer aren't running around with Kevlar vests. Like, you don't need a high powered rifle. And this, and this, I think, can transition maybe to the next phase, Marshall. You know, gun culture wars in America in 2022, it's not about hunting. There have been at least 5 million, more likely 10 million new people who purchased guns in the last two years, more time than any in modern American history. And every piece of survey data we has is, I don't trust the state to keep me safe. I fear for my life and believe that there is a possibility I may need to use deadly force in order to do so. That's just not a conversation about hunting. It's not about like gun, even gun culture. It's genuinely like a feeling of, I do not trust the state to keep me safe. And look, look what happened to Uvalde. I mean, look at Parkland. Look at so. Look at BLM riots. I mean, there. That's a legitimate feeling. Uh, if you, that's a legitimate feeling. Whenever you have declining social trust and a general feeling of complete lack of institutional trust and legitimate social chaos, which feels like it's engulfing everything. So I'm curious what you think of all that. Yeah, there's a lot to lot to respond there. So number one, I uh, I've mixed feelings on the. Parkland sheriff, you know, deputy response thing, because on the one hand, yeah, I, I, I agree. And as was been made clear this week, we seem to have a very clear issue of paddle to the metal, like what happens when this is happening, Like, there's a clear, and I want to get into it too, like what the governmental response needs to be. Um, a quick preview of that point is like, there clearly needs to be a mass evaluation of department procedures when mm -hmm. things happen, because if a weak response from officers on the scene has been a consistent factor in both cases. Oh, that's Columbine huge. too. Apparently, yeah. apparently it happened well, and, in Columbine. So from well, the beginning, and, and, yeah. yeah. So like you know that's a that's a and and to be fair, like most I saw tweets about this. Most departments changed their official policies post Columbine. Basically, what we're referring to is um, in Columbine. Apparently, like the team, like the SWAT teams, and they, they waited too long before going in. So on paper, in a lot of departments, it physically says like you need to go in. And to your point, Sagar, you, you, you had your quote, you said, you know, the shooting stops when, like, when the shooter's gone. Mm -hmm. um, that is a post-Columbine response thing. So the question is, like, why is that not implemented on, on the ground there? But I think at the same time, though, to speak to where, you know, center-left, Democratic, like, left listeners are coming from, I think focusing on the specific response of that sheriff is a little like, let's say it's 9-11 and there mm -hmm. is an air marshal on the flight. 
if there was an air marshal on the flight when the hijackers are coming and they have box cutters and he has a gun and let's say he freezes and doesn't shoot anybody, that would be a factor that needed to be discussed. And there should be a conversation about T- about TSA air marshal procedures, but there's still a bigger story going on. So regardless of how the cops respond, there's a bigger story. And I think the bigger story is something that you just got at too. And this is where the March for Our Lives thing comes in. I, you know, as I said before, I, I am just so sympathetic to everyone. And no, and I'm also in this category too, who's just, this isn't just a sympathy thing. It was just sick and tired of the status quo. Um, but what I need people to do, and it's very depressing that we don't have a political class that could do this, the following very difficult thing. Um, and it's incredibly difficult to do this. No one is asking someone to do this, but you know, it's cliche, but this is what statesmanship is. Someone needs to say, if you are Beto, taking away AR-15s, whether or not it's the proper policy, is literally not on the table right now in the yeah. country we live in. And I understand yeah. if you're Beto, let's be let's be totally good faith about this. Like I, I actually like always, always, I've always people be like, oh, like look at him, like interrupting the governor. It's cringe. He's a narcissist. Like no, like let's let's just like I, I think we'd be all better served in all these debates by assuming that people think what they actually think. Sure, gun people don't oppose let's say left-leaning reforms because the NRA hands them checks, they actually just disagree. I think Beto, look, Beto, like he's a Ivy League educated center-left Democrat who's upper middle class and above. That uh, is a- He's worth like $100 million. But yeah, I was being, ahead. we're, we're, we're yeah. doing the fair version. <laughs> yeah. We're doing the, the, the you know, on a, on a bad day, he's upper middle class. It's not a shocker that that is a person who would be like, oh yeah, like we do not need AR-15s in this country. He needs to be able to say, if he were to be a politician, I think it would be responsible. But it's like, look, I know what you're feeling. I feel your pain. Like that's the Bill Clinton quote. That is not on the table in the country we live in right now. That was on the table in 1994 during the 1990s because we lived in a different country back then. It's it's like on, on 15 different levels demographically, and that's done, and that's not just like a like a race reference. Just like literally, the country is like changed. People Can I die. Go into this? But, yeah, yeah. Well, just let me, let me, let me just, let me just, let me just, uh, caps, let me just capstone it, but I'll, I'll throw it to you. But it, it, it's, it's a different country. So you need to basically start from this position of my job as a politician in an environment where these sweeping changes that we may want aren't on the table. My job is to actually find out what actually is on the table and do that. Because I also think the activists would be in a better position. And they were better positioned in 2013, post Sandy Hook, and Mm -hmm. in 2017, post Parkland. But now that we know that every town does not work, now that we know that the NRA could basically fall apart as an organization and nothing will actually change here, now that we know that you know, you, you, I don't know. I'm sure you saw that. You saw that. You saw the tweets about how like we need to have a national school walkout. Republican politicians gun owners, their constituencies are not going to be swayed by that. That is cathartic. If you, if that is what you feel, I recommend you do something in these trying times, but that is not effective. Parkland does not make a difference. David Hogg or Emma Gonzalez getting like a, you know, big fancy Amazon documentary or a Netflix show or a speaking engagement or winning the time person of the year thing does not make a difference. So what I actually want from center left to left Democrats who do not like the status quo to do something very difficult, which is basically say, my job as a politician is to absorb the pain of my constituency and then do the very hard thing, which they cannot do and say, okay, what is actually on the table? What actually happened in the situation? In Texas, especially, the takeaway from this is not going to be AR-15s are banned. No, yeah, I guarantee. In that. the case, yeah. if Beto, if Beto were governor, snap. By, by the way, and you know this, the governor of Texas has basically no power. So He's even the least if Beto powerful won, governor in America, yeah, least powerful governor in America. So if that's not what's on the table, then what actually is on the table? Figure that out, and then take shit from your left, from your left, when people say you're a coward. Because people are going to say you're a coward. People are going to say you're weak. People are going to bring up LBJ. They're going to bring up FDR. And your job is to say, I'm not the, I am not those, I am not those people. 
the country is not the same country. They had legislative majorities when they did the thing that you wanted. And my job is to do it. And guess what? People are going to dunk on you. You're not going to win any awards for doing that. But that's what actual statesmanship looks like. And I'm just, I just don't see a way, a way out of that. But what's your, what's your response to the broader thing? Yeah, I did a whole monologue kind of talking about what you're talking about here. So this is really important. Okay, let me give you some advice to the uh, gun control people. In war, and this is from On War by Clausewitz, so you're going to get some of my graduate school uh, background. There is a concept of you need to attack the enemy's center of gravity. And determining what the enemy's center of gravity is is the single most important task of the person who is running the war and is a strategist. So in this case, the center of gravity of this discussion is not guns. It is declining social and institutional trust. So the year 1994 example is really important, Marshall, because I actually pulled the Pew Research data. There has only been one recent spike in institutional government trust in modern American history. So in 1961, so this is like the level post, of institutional post, trust- so this, is, so, quick thing. so this is like post-World War II. So like when you say modern American, you mean post-World War II, right? Yes, modern American history, post-World War II. 1961, we began uh, collecting this data. Some 70 to 80% of Americans either believed the government said or did the right thing all of the time or most of the time. Today, that number is 19% with only 2% who say that the government does something right all of the time. 2% from some 50 odd percent in 1961. There has only, and it's generally a basic straight line down. There has been one interruption in that decline uh, in modern American history. And it was in 1992 with the election of Bill Clinton and the booming stock market and obviously winning the uh, Cold War and a general sense of the unipolar moment. And the it year is not an accident. We, the year we were born. The year I was born, yeah. There is a reason that the 1994 Brady crime bill that Republicans had enough support, not from the NRA, from their constituencies to say, I legitimately trust the government to be the arbitrator of whether I can buy this AR-15 or not. Gun ownership today is a legitimate proxy against your trust of the government of institutions, and not just the federal government, the state and the local government around you. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that in a current moment where we not only have lowest on record institutional trust, also lowest on record trust amongst each other, there is no way you are gonna be taking guns away from people. And this is kind of what I'm saying. I actually would submit the Emma Gonzalez Amazon documentary and uh, a lot of the media attention on this genuinely hardens people because they're like, you know what? I'm never giving this up. I can see how modern you know, pop culture is completely taken over. And look, I mean, gonna be honest here, like this is literally my position at this point. I have become a legitimate semi-radical of where I was like probably 20 years ago because I don't, look, I live in Northern Virginia. I don't think these motherfuckers are coming to save me in a, in a, in a, in a, in like a legitimate riot. I don't think it's going to happen. Well, quick I thing, it sorry, happen right? let's, let's it happened last year. Well, well, not yeah. even last year. And you know, this is, yeah. this is the country we're living in right now. Um, near you in Northern Virginia, a, a guy almost got carjacked and he, and he shot, and he, he shot one of his carjackers. Um, That's right. People, and he was parked at a gas station and, you know, three like high school kids try to steal his car. Um, and hold him up and he, he, he killed one of them. Um, mm -hmm. and that is, that is the definition of the type of crime. And once again, that's not an assault weapon. So like that kind of, so this is, this is why your point is like it, it this, the, the thing that's very difficult here is you both have to get like nitty gritty, but you also have to take a step back and say like, okay, so yes. Cause I could hear someone say, see Marshall, yeah. you just said it. That's a handgun. You could have a handgun and not have assault weapons. That is not the broader foundational firmament that we're operating under. Can if, I also if, respond to that yeah, too? Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, Virginia Tech was with two Glock handguns, okay? Like, when you have a determination, it's going to happen. I'm not saying it won't happen on the margins. There have been a lot of hands, uh, a lot of school shooters who use handguns. Anyway, continue. Well, yeah, so, and, and so this, yeah. Is, this, is the, this is just the difficult point, which is I, I, I think the awkward position for people who, you know, support, like, Gun control, if you're coming from the right, because that's the that's the sort of semi pejorative way from the left, like common sense gun reform. It's not 2013 and it's not 2017. It's 2022. Um, at this point, 
I am really pained when I see people on Twitter legitimately, and I'm not saying it's disparaging, because this is terrible. Like, dude, you saw this yesterday. Like, the, the, the husband of one of the teachers who were killed, I had a heart attack and died. Like, that's terrible. Like, that's, 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 that's actually, like, yeah, it's, 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 it's it's barely comprehensible. By the way, hey, can we put the link in the description for their GoFundMe? I yeah, sent hundred dollars we'll, to that family. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put that there. Um, it's 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 been it's been really good and supportive. But I understand why, as a young person, I saw young people, right? So like, they're not launching my pillow competitor, David Hogg. Just like actual organic young people who are like, this crosses my line. We need to have a mass high school walkout. Like this tweet went viral. You have to understand after 2013 and after 2017. That is not an effective means for addressing what you what you are addressing. And I think it's deeply irresponsible and frankly something that just inf- reinforces cynicism when people in responsibility, people who are basically in the position to say to themselves, hmm, now that I know that the votes are in the Senate the way they are in the Senate, now that I know for sure, that cinema and mansion, like let's put aside, for example, um, let's put let's put aside the Republicans, are not going to be swayed by a high school walkout. I should not act as if that's going to work because when it doesn't work and you say it works, it's that is what actually like radicalizes people. So part oh, of the yeah. task, part that's of part of the about. part of the task here for being like a center left politician or basically anyone who doesn't like the status quo here is actually thinking to oneself, okay, I have my feelings. I have my emotions. I, I I know, and I won't even say virtue signaling. I, I I'm getting increasingly exhausted by virtue signaling. Like I I know what my emotional response as a human being should be to this. A your I I I think it's not. I understand at a political level the response of okay, gun control isn't going to be effective or, or isn't actually going to change, um, or this is what we can do. This is what we can't do. On the other hand, I think it's important and it's just true that people's response is always going to be like, this is terrible. This could never happen again. So you, 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 you have to do both and you have to be responsible about it. But what's, I want to get into what I actually want to have happen coming here because we've done a lot of, um, dunking on, on Democrats, but it's time we switch to, to Republicans here. The Greg Abbott, um, my, my new governor, I guess, um, talking, doing the like, we need to focus on mental health talking point. When it's revealed that just a few months ago he cut hundreds of millions of dollars from like the Texas like mental health budget, and once again let's get real like as we know with budgets like who knows like what well, was no, in that no, specific it's worse. It's, it's worse it's worse so so because I, he won't yeah. accept he will not accept federal government ACA dollars for mental health okay so he asked that yeah so he's so feds he, ex- are like explain the, so explain the dynamic what's what, explain what's happening there. This is a big fight all the way back to 2010. Basically, Obamacare set up these massive pools of funds that the federal government can give to states in order to expand coverage. A lot of red states said, no, we don't want your Obamacare dollars because that's going to lead to federal interference in our health care system. Governor Abbott maintained the position on the stage saying, I will not take federal government dollars to expand mental health capacity because he made the correct point, which is there is not a mental health hospital within 40 miles of Uvalde, Texas. Okay, um, you know, and he, he said, oh, we can the, find yeah. the funds yeah. elsewhere. Where? Because you also want to cut taxes. <laughs> no, and, 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 and this is, and, I, and I, think, I think that's the, this is, I think, I think this is what's interesting. I'm sorry, I'm sure you've, I don't know about how your Twitter feed is, but I have definitely yeah. noticed a bit of a, a vibe shift um, with mm. even kind of like center right people. And I think it's because something interesting generationally is happening here. So once again, I was talking about Aaron and Armand, the producers. Armand is in college. Aaron's in high school. They were talking about how, you know, for them, they just think about this position, this issue, because they grew up with active shooter drills and all of these shootings basically every year at an increasing rate. So what you have happening there is people said, oh, that dynamic is going to change the debate around this issue. I think what's actually going to happen first is millennials like us, we're now like, you have a house now. I'm moving yeah. to a house in Texas. Like I'm not thinking about school right. districts. You're thinking about school districts. We are going to think about this issue differently from any direction, right? Like, you know, pro-gun, anti-gun, just because our generation is going to be much more interested in it at a literal level. And I think in that situation, 
Greg Abbott being able to use some 2010s era Tea Party BS of like, oh, you know, the federal government and trying mm-hmm. to look good for his national campaign doesn't look doesn't look effective. So what I think actually needs that, and this is actually um, speaking to me, what I what what I would do. So actually, I'll phrase it this way: um, I'll give my answer. You give your answer. If you were if you were a senator in Jetty, um, I want to know like what your response would be. Because here's what here's what my response would be if I were Senator um, Senator Kozlov. What I would basically say is, look, to this is the point that gun that you know pro gun people make. Like our country has had a unique relationship with guns since the country was founded. The Second Amendment. Um, it's very exhausting when people say things like, "But Australia did this, and New Zealand did that, and the UK does this." It's like, hey, yeah. I know like the whole like flag waving, like American exceptionalism thing is kind of cringe. And we spent a lot of our like elementary and high school age, like thinking that that's like not a real thing. Like Obama had his famous, like, yeah, I believe in American exceptionalism, but like, so do the Greeks. We believe, they believe in Greek exceptionalism and the French believe in French exceptionalism. When it comes to gun culture, the U S actually is unique. So if you're doing political analysis, if to your point, Sagar, you're trying to find the center of gravity of this issue, you cannot think to yourself, oh, we are just like Australia. Let's operate as if that were true. You know, to br- to bring this back to warfare, because there's a good Machiavelli, Machiavelli quote about how ultimately, like warfare and war is just a good way of thinking about politics. If you're facing the German army in 1939, it isn't helpful to say, "Well, this thing worked against the Italians in Ethiopia." Let's apply this thing to the Germans. These, these are different countries. They're different people. They have different abilities, different perspectives. Like that, that's a, that's a very important part here. So A, you have to recognize that the U.S. is fundamentally unique. But then B, you have to recognize, I think this is a very fair center left point that I have not seen a particularly convincing response to from people like Greg Abbott. We've always had the most guns of any country. We haven't had the spate of mass shootings that are accelerating. At a seemingly exponential rate that they've exp- that, that have happened over the past ten years. So yes, we've always had guns. That's always been a reality. You know, we've had assault weapons since the post World War II period, but people weren't taking the new like M16 into their high schools even during the firmament of the late '60s. Like, frankly, like what radicals were doing, where they were like, where they, they were letting off bombs, like the Weather Underground and those different groups. Um, they, they they weren't like hauling assault rifles into schools. So something unique is happening in this moment. And let's just be real about this. I don't think anyone particularly understands that. So what I would like to have happen here, and I know this sounds cringe. I was telling this to my girlfriend, Olivia. She was saying, okay, Mr. Like Problem Solvers Caucus. I actually think there needs to be a commission um, in the mm. same way that there was a 9-11 commission. Because I now think, and this is something that changed for me this week, I now think this has reached the level from a societal perspective of of what the war on terror was in October 20, 2001. And by that, I mean, we have this problem. Um, like, what were the risks of getting hit in a terrorist attack after 9-11? Like, very, 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 very incredibly low. Yeah, like, we as, and like, let's put aside the Iraq war for a second. We as a society recognize this problem, said to ourselves, like, yes, like, the chances are this, 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 or that, but we think the following actual changes need to happen. We think this is the diagnosis of the problem. Here were the vulnerabilities in the TSA checking process in the airplane. Like, for example, like, there's a reason why you can no longer open an airplane cockpit from the outside. Um, like that is an example of a like thing you could just change. So think of what we're talking about earlier in the episode saga. We're saying like, oh, you know, Ted Cruz is saying things like we need to have single point of entry. People are saying things like, this is why we need to have like an armed guard on campus. You saw girl raising, but wait a second. We've had armed people in these two big situations that really define the politics, yet they actually either didn't do their jobs or didn't make a difference. Separate from the question of banning guns, there are actually a huge number of very empirical questions. It's an empirical question of, hey, what actually are the procedures in police departments near schools when it comes to these things? If you are a school resource officer, what is your job? Is your job, are you trained from the second you walk into the police yeah. academy to charge into the thing and kill the guy? Or are you told, look, this is complicated. You need to make a judgment call on the space. Those are like very empirical questions. And I actually think just the next step here, and once again, this is why this is difficult to do, you need to basically say to yourself, look, we're not going to ban a gun. 
we could have a conversation about that if the Democrats ever take power again. Or actually, this is actually an argument for Democrats to make in 2024. If, if, if Think of Crystal's point. Crystal's point is the current Supreme Court of its conservative majority holds a different interpretation of the Second Amendment than her version of the Supreme Court. Okay, in 2024 or in 2022, one of Christo's arguments for supporting the Democratic Party should be, hey guys, we have a different vision of how the Supreme Court should operate. I think the court should be able to restrict these things. Therefore, I'm going to support a president, Joe Biden, or Democratic Senate candidates who would hold that different position. Like That's like a longer, mid to long-term like political thing that's up for grabs. But the short-term decision is not, let's pass a assault weapons ban. Because that is not on the table. What I would love to hear, and I think this would also help hold people accountable more, is like, what actually, what does mental health even mean? Like, I, I, I would want this commission not to basically say like, okay, hey, like, let's, you know, let's uh, recommend that you pass this set of bills or this like gun ban. Okay, like, let's look at major metro- metropolitan and rural areas. Like, where, okay, where are the closest mental health hospitals? Um, when, when, when Ted Cruz says this is a mental health thing, Okay, what does that even mean? Like, does does that mean that the second like I go to a psychiatrist, he has to report that to the FBI? That's up for grabs. Like, I don't I don't know what any of these terms mean, and because no one actually knows what these terms mean, it, it, we're not actually able to debate them and engage on them. So I think that's what I, I think. What I would tell people if I were, I guess, I'm basically articulating myself as if, as if I'm a Democrat here. I'm an independent, but if I'm a Democratic senator from Oregon, where I'm from, my position would be: Look, let's win the midterms and keep the Senate. And let's, and so that you can have a conversation about the filibuster and let's win the presidency in 2024. So Trump can't appoint more justices. But in the short term, let's approach this the way we approach the 9 11 commission and look at these very tactical situations that have happened and give unironically nonpartisan responses to this. And then the other thing that you can't have come out of this, because I know this is not probably what our listenership would do, you can't have a pointy headed Harvard academic say, have the report conclude this is a white nationalism problem. Um, yeah. Because you know that's the, what, that, 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 yeah. that is the that is the immediate and look, like, let's get real. Like the shooter in Buffalo, like he was a white nationalist. But what you have to understand, and this is why policy is different than politics, there there can be things that are empirically true. Like there is a young male white nationalism radicalization issue. In this country, that's what happened in Buffalo. That's what happened in Christchurch in New Zealand. But you have to understand the second that enters into public debate, that debate is now over. So you have to very, very discreetly say, okay, this is like, this is my last thing. I'll let you go. When we made the decision post 9 11 to make it so you could no longer open up the cockpit door on a flight, that question had nothing to do with whether the person is trying to hijack the plane is a radical jihadist or a white nationalist or a 1960s like weatherman. The point was it is not safe to have planes where someone could force their way inside of the cockpit and commandeer the airline. That is that 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 is that is a way of thinking about it. The, the, the ideological reality that, that that's a 1994 conversation. It's not a 22 one. How how do you think about what you would do? I mean, my problem is there's no incentive to do what you did. So while you were talking, I just looked it up. John Cornyn basically did this actually very well back in 2018. You know, I was talking about uh, the National Informational Criminal System, the database that you run the guns through that failed. He passed an act. He legitimately got it done in 2018 to pass the Fix Nix Act. Have you ever heard of it? Like most people haven't. And I just think that in the current media environment, And in political environment, there is literally no incentive, both from a base level and from a media level, in order to do what you're talking about. Because if you were the senator from Oregon, you would get destroyed by MSNBC, Marshall. And what we know right now, like Chris Hayes and Rachel Maddow and all those people will say, call you a stick in the mud. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, What do we talk about here all the time? Democratic voters actually really trust the media. And then same thing. You know, actually, this is a good example. Red flag. I have complicated feelings on the red flag law. Um, To be honest, I would support it in spirit, but after seeing how it's been used, it it scares me in terms of how easy it is in order to stop people from buying a gun. But that's a separate conversation. Dan Crenshaw supported red flag legislation. He got raked for it. 
by the Republican press, by the GOP media, and continues to this day to be one of the main ticks against him amongst MAGA faithful. And by the way, it's not like anybody in the media ever gave Dan Crenshaw credit for voting for a red flag or supporting red flag legislation. So when you have completely like, what's the term? Not bi-directional, like omni-direct, whatever. Opposite directional. <laughs> um, we needed polls. a moment of levity in this episode. I appreciated that. <laughs> when you have two, for people who are looking, I'm literally putting my hands, like when you have two things that are pulling you this way, what are you supposed to do? Like if I was a senator from Texas, I would be a fucking idiot to support red flag laws or anything. Ted Cruz is actually doing exactly what the people, most probably, I'm going to bet, people in Texas want, which is they're like, no, this is going to be used by the left in order to, you know, come after our guns, which, you know, is true. And like, he's like, I, I'm going to support that. And most people there, especially from that region, I mean, you know, it's funny. Go and look at some of the people whose kids were killed, who are talking like a lot of these people are Republicans. Um, I would be willing to bet a lot of them are, uh, you know, one of them, and it, this really was so disgusting. We were going after him because he was like shit posting Kyle Rittenhouse memes. And because they're like, oh, look at him. Like this father of a murdered kid was, you know, pro Kyle Rittenhouse. I'm like, why don't you ask yourself like what that guy actually wants now? Okay. Like the people, you know, involved, like don't necessarily get to make the decision, but more what I'm saying is that, look, I just come back to the trust issue. I don't, I don't really, this is why I don't want to be in office, by the way. You know? No, and I, I, was gonna, I, was gonna, I 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 was it's gonna just say not like possible. The, the, the funny, the funny, the funny bit here is, and once again, this isn't funny, but it's just, it's just the true fact is there's like, this is the, this is actually the, the, obvi the obvious answer why we're in media and, and, and not running for office now because this, and this is why it's exhausting. The hard truth that, like, I guess this is your point, the, the hard truth that a politician cannot tell you is that right now is just not a moment of sweeping change um, yeah. on either on either side if you're donald trump uh, you're not going to overturn obamacare you're gonna, a bunch of people are going to tell yeah, you this can't. is you know Ameri yeah. the american people want you know across the state line patient protected free no no they don't no they like no they don't or they'll give you a random poll that says they do but the second it's up john mccain is going to say no and be politically rewarded for it so I think the reason why, and I think this, I think this is what unifies the two. The, I think that this unifies, and then we'll get to we'll, we'll close on a quick uh, Taiwan thing with NATO. But I think the thing that unifies our body of work now, especially if we've gotten deeper into this system of politics, is I want to just gird people for what this decade is. If you, if you come into this decade, if you come into this political system expecting sweeping change from any angle, I'm sorry. You know, you're gonna have a bad time to make to quote <laughs> South Park. You're gonna yeah. have a bad time. You're gonna you're going to come away as cynical. Versus, I actually don't think you and I are cynical because because some people people have said that he was like, oh, you guys saying nothing can change. Like, no, it's not cynical. We're just being realistic, and that's what politics is about. What we are saying is there are moments of American history. By the way, the other the other 1920s was not a moment of big sweeping change. Yeah, uh, literally I, nothing either happened. either the nothing happened. Opposite. Yeah, <laughs> nothing happened, and and I I don't think the current I, I I did an episode of Yoram Hazoni that dropped um, the Friday before this episode came out, and Yoram was talking about how like man like the thing that unifies my work is that it feels like the country is dissolving, and it can't go on like this forever. I, I I agree with that, but it seems to me at a very clear level we aren't at that breaking point. Ha <laughs> ha! I said it, yeah. and what we can do as media figures who thanks to our supportive audiences, aren't going to be like voted out of these podcasts. We can say, hey, look, the best we can do is provide you with a useful mental model and a framework for approaching that breaking point and approaching this moment with just realism. Because I just hate when, look, you know, I got in this argument with Christo and Kyle and they're like, oh, like 70% of, uh, oh, this is good. This is my last word on this topic because y you always do a good job of pushing back against me when I am a little too hyperbolic and say, there's no such thing as corruption explaining why things happen in this country. I, I, I always overstate it. People always send in an email, you check me off the call. We are like, dude, okay, come on. Like you don't actually believe that. And I, I don't actually believe that. But what I was getting, I told you the day, told you this the day of the shooting. The reason why I get frustrated when people blame everything on corruption and cynicism is you see tweets like, 
you saw this tweet going around. The NRA gave thirteen million dollars to Mitt you don't Romney, care. and right. th- that has you would have the same position anyway. Yeah, th- this this is the way I explain this to to left yeah. to center left and Democratic listeners. This is like Ted Cruz tweeting whenever Roe v. Wade falls. Planned Parenthood action gave this money to Democrats. That's why they're opposing me on abortion topics. No, it's because you actually just disagree. The awkward reality for the country is that right now, despite the fact that a lot of our audience and people like Andrew Yang and Tulsi Gabbard are talking about how like, oh, like this binary two-party system and oh, like they're telling us that you have to pick a side. Eh, They're actually all all over these big issues in this country where there actually just are two sides. You're pro-choice, you're pro-life. Our country is too restrictive about abortion. We're not restricted enough. You think there are too many guns in this com- country. You think there are too many guns in this country. You think it's too easy to get a gun. You think, frankly, it should be even easier. Greg Abbott had his tweet where he's like, Texas, we're only the second biggest gun buying state. Let's, get, let's pump those numbers. Those are binary choices. And if you are just someone who likes to reject that binary, or frankly, and I'll just say this, I, I like Andrew, we had Zach Grauman on, or like to pretend that there isn't binary choices in front of us, you're not really well set up for this. So Sagar, what's your, what's your last word on this, on this topic? Yeah. I mean, we're living in the 1890s people and, uh, it took a long time to crawl out of it. I just don't need think to have that author on that. you're referencing the age yeah. of acrimony. We need to have that. We need to have, um, the guy it's not John just age of acrimony from a very basic level. Like nothing happened from like 1875 to like 1910. That's an entire lifetime, right? Especially considering what the lifespan was. It's a political it's a, po- it's a it's a political lifetime. Yeah. As in like, you that, can vote to like when you're yeah. What's that guy's name? Mark Hanna? Most people probably don't even know who I'm talking about. Oh uh, that guy. Yeah, Mark Hanna. He was a defining politician of the era. He was a king. You know, he's like a kingmaker. Uh a lot of people should go actually go back and read how boss politics and all that stuff, or Jim Pendergast, you know. That was a little bit before. But anyway, the point that I'm making is that or sorry, that was a little bit after. The point that I'm making is that there was an entire period of this country where all of our politics were literally run by boss politics and state legislatures, and nothing happened while people became absolutely filthy rich that then led to the progressive era of the 1910s and the 1920s, and and obviously the First World War and all of that. I think that's what we're living in. It takes a long time to shake out. And I just, you know, I always talk about this whenever in the context of Ukraine, when people are like, it's over, like Russia lost. I'm like, yo, it's been three months. Like the win- the winter war of uh, the, how long was the winter war? Nine months? I think actually, maybe a actually, year. It, no, it actually, it actually wasn't that long. I had uh, oh, book recommendations for people. I finally got Stalin's war. It's about um, World War II from oh, Stalin's yeah, perspective. Oh yeah, I heard that was good. It's very good. You'll, you'll enjoy it. It's on our shared. It's on our shared Audible. Mm. But um, it actually didn't go that long. And actually, it's it's kind of funny. Um, this is a good pivot to the Taiwan thing. We'll finish up with. Um, the author says that one of Stalin's smartest decisions was cutting the Winter War when he cut it. Um, and this is actually the difference between Stalin oh, as a oh, strategist. I'm sorry, I, I said Winter War. I didn't mean the Finland War. Oh, I okay. meant uh, the interwar period, the phony war. That's what I'm talking oh, yeah, about. The yeah, phony yeah. war. 1939 that, to like the Battle of Britain, something so like but, that. So, so the phony yeah. war, yeah. So I just want to, yeah, because that, that's that's good. People like the history, but so yeah. the phony war is, you know, uh, if Germany takes Poland, the Russians invade Poland, Germany and France mobilize, Germany, sorry, uh, Britain and France mobilize, but then there's no actual war in the West, on the Western, in Western Europe for nine months. The winter yeah. war that I was referring to was Finland versus Russia, where, where funnily enough, like technically speaking, uh, Russia actually won the winter war in actually, the sense that yeah. they got their territorial concessions. Um, but like if you're Finland, you totally pulverized the, 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 the Russian army and actually helped. Convince, very similar to put, Ukraine. Very, very yeah. And, 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 yeah. and this is, and this is actually an interesting point here. The, what the author points out, what Stalin did that it's not clear Putin could do is Stalin ended the war at the right moment. He, mm. he, he basically was able to say, Look, I know I have these like broader objectives. I know I'm getting humiliated. There's these broader things. It fits my strategic calculus to say enough is enough. I've got what I've needed. I can leave. It's been very clear that I don't think Putin has this has has that ability. Um, see, it's only been three months. But that's but it was only three months in the Winter War example. Like that, 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 yeah, that, but they that's lost a the, hundred thousand troops. I mean, there's only been what the, maybe like twenty five, thirty thousand Russians killed. If, Look, if, I'm just saying. Well, yeah. it's not just well. If you add in total casualties, they're up. They're between fifty and seventy five because casualties aren't just you know. It's it's not just a question of uh, how many people are killed. It's the question of like 
So for example, like diminishing your international position, mm-hmm. convincing people you're weak. Like my, my, my point is I am not, I am not convinced at all that Putin has a accurate, and once again, like this whole war was a strategic miscalculation. Um, I think the difference between Putin and, and Stalin in this case is that Stalin had the ability to, 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 uh, I think calculate like the maximum point of pulling out. Um, but just to, just to close on this, uh, let's just close with like a quick reaction. We'll have to do like a broader episode about this, but, um, you know, President Biden, is, is in Asia this week, um, last week, because this is coming out on Tuesday. Um, he has said the state where he explicitly said he wants the U.S. to protect Taiwan in the case of ta- uh, Chinese aggression. Uh, Secretary Blinken gave a big speech. Um, where are your thoughts on this stuff? Yeah, actually, I talked to Bridge right after Bridge Colby, who's been on the podcast, who's on Breaking Points. I actually think he made a really excellent point, which is, look, whatever you think of the Taiwan defense policy or not, if that's the actual U.S. defense policy, we're doing a terrible job of actually making that happen, which is that currently the Javelin missile stock that we have all sent to Ukraine, in addition to a lot of the aid that we've sent over there, is legitimately being taken away from the stuff that we were supposed to give to Taiwan and is not now going to be replaced for probably over a year because of the semiconductor manufacturing crisis. I mean, that's insane. And the point that Bridge made was, he's like, okay, so if you're really telling me that you're talking about a war which will redefine 50% of the GDP of the world, in addition to some 40 odd percent of US imports, and we're just treating it like a complete joke, even with uh, Secretary Blinken, you say whatever you want. Say you're talking a huge game. Oh, US policy towards China is the future. That's bullshit. I mean, all America, US defense systems, U.S. military aid, U.S. uh, establishment, foreign policy, NSC, everything is focused on Europe. And this has just been my strategic, look, I know a lot of people have been pissed off at me, and I honestly don't care. The future of the United States is not going to be defined between the contra, uh, the, the, the conflict between Ukraine and with Russia. And also people have said, well, how come you don't bring up the nuclear uh, aspect with China? I absolutely do. I'm just telling you that the risks on nuclear war and more actually make a lot more sense. We're talking about the literal future and the bedrock of the U.S. economy for a variety of reasons than it does for a Eastern Ukrainian or Eastern European country outside of our sphere of influence, well outside of our sphere of influence, where we just don't have as much strategically at stake. And I just don't think you can walk and chew gum at the same time. Like I literally don't think it's possible in current modern Washington. I think you're doing a shit job, especially because their uh, entire orientation towards China is basically like trying to appear tough while also being weirdly woke, like always constantly being like, our war is not with the Chinese people. Like, listen, I got nothing against Chinese Americans, but you know, they literally shut down the FBI branch of the Department of Justice, which was going after Chinese espionage out of uh, identitarian racism concerns. And by the way, just last week, a pair of Chinese American professors were just indicted for trying to uh, for trying to steal Moderna and Pfizer mRNA IP and send it back to the CCP. So I just think their strategic orientation is completely false. And there's like a Europhilic obsession amongst the US press and the US establishment and Secretary Blinken, frankly, he's a Francophile, a long time kind of Euro, Europhile in terms of his work at the State Department. I think Biden also dramatically suffers from this. And given his past China policy, honestly, it was a disaster. So that's where I'm at. Look, I, I think the core of our disagreement is I think that, A, I think it's it's very clear that <laughs> let's just say the word sphere of influence when it comes to Ukraine is very contested right now because if it were uh, if let's just say if, if Ukraine were totally within Russia's sphere of influence relative to NATO and Central and Eastern Europe, uh, they would have air supremacy right now and would not have a Ukrainian uh, air force that could still conduct sorties um, and would not be would okay. Would but not so be, my, that's but no, not no, the no, point. no, 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 but, no, yeah. but, it, but, it, no, but, it, but it is the point, and because I think that. You can't Why, just, because we gave them an air force and basically are the ones well, we, no, who are no, we, we, showing we, them how we, to we, do we, it. Like, no, we, 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 no, we didn't give them the air. That's that's actually the whole the whole point. We did we didn't give them the air force, and Russia like clearly doesn't have the ability to totally exert um, control over Ukraine, given given Western allied support. I think the situation is similar in Taiwan, and that's influence how we how we think about it. Um, to the javelin point, I think the javelin point um, is largely 
basically kind of irrelevant because javelins are a specific weapon that are relevant to the style of warfare that's undergoing in Ukraine right now. Wide open spaces, tanks, that basic question. The, the question. I mean, in, you should the, take that up with the Taiwanese who say that we want those javelins. Okay, of course. Yeah. The, the, the Taiwanese, yeah. the Taiwanese want everything. Everyone, you know, the the Ukrainians want F thirty five. Yeah, the not, Ukrainians want everything, and they're I mostly know, getting uh, almost everything that they uh, want, uh, including uh, long range missile systems. Tell that. To, uh, I, think, I, think, I think. I think. I think. I think the Ukrainians would very, very strongly disagree. NATO just informally announced that they're not going to give tanks or airplanes. My point is the javelin question isn't relevant to Taiwan as much. Look, like it's a problem that we have a shortage of javelins, like we should repair them. But like the, and I talked about this with Bridge, like it's, it's funny that he's like kind of refocused the way he's articulating this. We did an episode on this. Javelins matter in Ukraine because you have big, wide open plains where you're engaging in tank warfare. Um, the age of the tank may just be over given how, like, a, how defensively minded this basically is. Um, versus if you're looking at Taiwan, the time, the Chinese do not need to cross 50 miles of open plain where if we literally were not giving them javelins, there'd be a huge issue. They need to cross 50 miles of nautical, of 50 nautical miles, um, under fire. Where, and this is why I think it's just totally ridiculous at this point to say that what happens to Ukraine doesn't determine what happens to Taiwan. The flagship of Russia was sank by a surface to, to sea Neptune missile that the Brits gave them. So if you are China, by definition, you are less confident in your ability to cross 50 miles of nautical ocean and even deploy those tanks in the first place. Also, and this is a secondarily important topic, airborne forces were totally wrecked in those first few, few days of the war. I know there's this whole debate of, you know, the, the Glenn Greedwald listeners to the show who are going to be like, oh, like Russia, like held back and oh, like this, this, this or that. The thing that's completely uncontestable is that airborne forces were wrecked in the first few days of the war. Airborne drops over Kiev, over the airports, over those bits were completely in, ineffective. The Vedeve was completely wrecked. That is not an effective means. So if you are China now, the strategic situation in front of you is okay crap we can't, anti anti sea missiles from ground are incre- from land are incredibly effective it'd be very doable for our ships to be sank before they even get there in the first place secondarily we also cannot merely just drop all of these um, paratroopers, because now the paratrooper track record is even weaker than it was before. Yeah, terrible. Um, you know, the the basically other. Than, the, the, I'm not trying to like overstep my military expertise here, mm-hmm. but other than basically like these issues like D-Day, like the track record of the paratrooper has not been great. Operation well, Market Garden, it was a little, yeah, right. Like, so, so fair. That's a narr- that's a narrative like domination thing. But like the the, the Germans fa- fa- um, famously. Um, by the way, I think one of the coolest German words is Falschenjäger. Mm-hmm. That is the word for for Ger- the German word for paratrooper. I think they it get, worked in Norway and in it, it, Denmark. It worked in AKA non. See, this is the thing: yeah. non contested environments. The 101st Airborne also dropped into Iraq during Desert Storm One and the second in the Operation Iraqi Freedom. But the point is, like, it, it's not been very effective. It has been effective in the more contested parts of World War II. It was not effective in Crete in 1941, and it was not effective here. So, if you're the Chinese, because of what's happened in Ukraine, you are less confident. I strongly think that once we made it to the first few days of the war in Ukraine, the, Ch- the Chinese are less likely now to invade because of the setbacks the Russians have experienced there. So that's why I think the war matters there. But that being said, I think the place where I can end my comments and where you and I entirely agree is just the broader lack of seriousness, which, which Bridge is basically speaking about. Um, because I think the key thing that you're really saying here is there should be serious doubt of the ability to reconstitute those javelins. There should be serious doubt about the ability to get the proper um, ground land to see this was there in the first place. Uh, we, we, we should, like, I, you know what? I actually, this is actually funny, and this goes to your point. And I think this is where I think this is where the broader point about like the overfocus on Europe comes into effect. I think that the the Europe hands, the people working on the NSC in Europe, the Defense Department, the White House, they are doing a great job. Um, at, w- at what they are supposed to do, I don't think we have as much confidence in the people focusing on the Asia desk. Not even close. And yeah, and this is so. This is actually weirdly. Maybe this is a race thing. Maybe I can actually try to apply some racial framework to this. Oh, fun! There See. just seems to be like a generation of people who came up on the Cold War and who studied abroad in Europe and who spent a lot of time in Paris and in London and Berlin throughout their childhoods and adulthoods that made them so emotionally connected to Kyiv and to Ukraine and to this entire conflict. 
in a way that they are honestly just don't think about in terms of India and China and um, and Taiwan, like and Singapore, Japan. I mean, we seem to have lost uh, the understanding of how central American power is to the status quo in East Asia. And am I the only one who can read a fucking chart in terms of GDP population and what the future looks like. This actually, again, this was a very much like Obama talking point, which I think legitimately was derailed by this Europhilic obsession with the Atlantic Council and the German Marshall Fund and like every other national security like think tank around here. And I I genuinely think this might be a case where because I am from India and I just don't care as much about or my parents are from India and I don't care as much about Europe that I'm able to just much more, uh, much more just like dispassionately say, okay, well, I think the future is obviously, by the way, I like Europe. I've been to Europe. It's a nice place to visit. It's got flat uh, economic growth, population decline. Uh, there Wait, can, I ask, can, can I ask you this? People, people I always ask, get it. People always like, ask you this question. Why is everything yeah. about GD- GDP for you? Oh, well, because that's basically the backbone of, I mean, the entire case for defending Taiwan is that, or defending Taiwan or securing case in East Asia is because the literal, everything I am using right now to broadcast this is from that part of the world. In terms well, of future well, American well, exports. What's, what's funny, that's, well, that's not the true. That's not, I'm not saying that's not true. I'm saying but that's not the entire argument. I mean, okay, outside of democracy and all of that, like the entire case for defending Taiwan is that we will be legitimately poor if they were taken over by China. Like poor, poverty, the level of unable to consume basic goods at a very basic level. 40% of the world's trade moves through the Straits of Malacca. We could be completely cut off from everything that we would need in order to sustain like a current modern American way of life that our population is literally not ready for. That's actually something willing and able in order to go to war for. Now, I don't know why that that's, I mean, what? I don't live in a, we don't live in a dilettantish society. We're going to war on purely moral grounds alone makes any sense. Well, it's not, well, or look, again, you can like, defend well, it if well, you well, want well, to. Well, well, no, but, like, but, but this is, but this is, I think the reason why yeah. I'm pushing back against this is I think the most eloquent thing you said was your point of like, why, your position, why, why what happens in Taiwan like truly matters and why it's worth the risk. Um, cause the point you're making on the nuclear side is that you think the risk, it, it's not that, cause as you said, like the, 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 it's not as if you think there's like a 50% chance that nukes fly in Ukraine. Your point is relative to the benefits. Yes. The risk is not worth taking. You think yes. th- this is, this is me explaining to listeners who get confused by this point. You think the risk is worth it in Taiwan. It's not worth here. My broader point though is, and I, this is what this is what misses, which is like, look, dude, like Hitler's ability to get into the Sudetenland in 1938. Sudetenland, it's a corner of the Czech, it's the corner of Czechoslovakia. Who gives a shit? The GDP is crap. They're like a yeah. random. Like my point well, is, there's a reason like, we didn't go to war for it at the time. Well, no, but 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 clearly, or not even clearly. The British and the, the British and French and even the Russians, the Russians guaranteed Czech, the Soviets had guaranteed Czech security. Everyone would have been better off if they'd unified against in that case. So all I'm trying to do is just say that like, I, my position is looking at the history of this. We cannot reduce down the case to war purely on a GDP because it will cause, it will cause you to miss things. And once again, there's been pretty universal agreement. This is not a controversial point I'm about to say. Russia's difficulties in Ukraine have almost certainly dissuaded the Chinese from making a short term. Uh, yeah, but that's move not the case Ukraine. that was made. That was not the case. No, no, but no, but no, but no, but no, but it's that's, an that's, ancillary no, but benefit. No, 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 but 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 it's no, but it's not the case. No, 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 no. Go, we, no, no, listen, no, no. Listeners could go back and listen to the first emergency episode we did. I specifically said, look, I'm not at the NSC, yeah. but I specifically said a war where Vladimir Putin is able to invade Ukraine. People could go back and listen to the episode as one of our best episodes. Yeah, but episodes. you're not the one who's driving no, you. No, no, calls. no, but no, dude. And that like, wasn't this is, the position made in the no, White no, House. No, 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 but, the, no, but, the, the, but this is my, dude, I did 30 days of episodes on this. I know this topic. There's a difference between the Biden administration's ability to articulate this properly. Like, Frank, I think I'd be a much better, like, Pentagon spokesman than what they're doing. <laughs> there's, a there's a difference. There's a difference 
between their inability to clearly and confidently articulate the public case. Like you said, I think they're hamstrung by just like, I'm not going to say it's like wokeism, but it's basically just like, they're just hamstrung and they're not like aggressive and articulate enough. But if you talk to anyone in the NSC, they would say that position. If you talk to Rush Doshi, if you talk to, if you talk to, um, like I say, Jen Harris, the person who got this podcast, mm-hmm. it's fun, it's funding at Hewitt. They will say what I just said. This was the internal position of the Biden administration. It's to their detriment that they are unable to articulate what I just articulated. Um, so look, like it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a rolling thing. Um, with, with, with these episodes, people like when it's, it's, it's really funny. Like if you look at the YouTube comments, someone always goes, Marshall and Sager disagree at like point X in the thing. But no, but it's good though. It's, it's, it's come on, Sager. It's good. I know I, I, know. I do whatever you want. I don't care. I'm just like, guys, it's not a fucking TV show. Okay. We're just talking. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that was a that was a funny that was a funny moment. But no, this was this is really. Well, I good. get the same thing. Like, oh, sparks fly. I'm like, yo, <laughs> literally the opposite of why I do this is oh. to get away from manufacturing. So people don't know this. I have done so much cable TV. Oh yeah, I hate manufactured disagreements, talking points, like and fetishizing um, disagreement on media actually really is to your detriment. I want people to know that. So, no, I anyway. love that. No, thank you. No, thank you for making that clear. Cause actually you and I agree on this point because nothing is more cringe. Like, look, we do it for the clicks, but when we do a breaking points clip, James writing in Marshall and Sager debate mm-hmm. is painful to me. Cause to your point, it speaks of like crossfire manufactured Marshall's the hawk, Sager's the dove debate. Yeah, it- it's cra- it's 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 inorganic. It's gross. There's something gross about it. Yes, correct. I I really don't like uh like the fetishization of like manufactured disagreement. I think it should come about organically, and I think that when people do it, they should talk and really air things out. And also, this is another point against clipping, which is that like being like at this timestamp to this timestamp, you miss the lead up to that. Like we're just, we're, 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 we're agreed for 40 minutes. We agreed for 40 minutes, right? Not even that. You don't even know the context of like where it was coming from. Um, this is why I prefer and literally charge for over at Breaking Points for people to watch the full show. And even people there, some people, premium people will be like, hey, like I want to watch it just in clips. I'm like, honestly, I'm like, no, because it is a better product. Um, it is a, it, it is a product that I legitimately want to put out into the world. Same here which is one long full thing. You can, you know, if people want to clip it up and watch it the way, that's fine. I understand in terms of convenience and all that, but it's just such a subpar way in order to consume uh, information. It, it really is. Well, everyone, that's all she yeah. wrote. Thank you for uh, joining us. Once again, check out the Supercast if you enjoy these episodes and listen to the full episodes to Sagar's, Sagar's point. Like we, like I, I, I want this to be you and I just like people, 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 when people like email about this, these types of episodes, they're like, oh, we like how you two are just like talking, like going back and forth. Like, I do not want this. To, there was a way where we marketed this as like a yeah. debate show, and that's a fucking infuriating. Suck. So, we're yeah, not going to do that. All right. That's it. Thanks for joining us on the realignment.